Hi and welcome to Midnight Cry. I'm your host, Romo Gassane, and today we have with us Jay Smith. He'll be continuing to talk to us about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. First of all, welcome to the show, Jay. Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks. Now, we've been talking quite a bit about the life of Muhammad. Now, we're assuming that he is a prophet. What I would like to ask is, is there any type of assessment or criteria for a prophet? No. I think it's important that we do ask this question. We looked at the historical problems already. That's a whole debate in of itself. It's a, an external debate. It's a debate that's happening in the West. It's a debate that's happening in Europe. Mm. Now we're moving into an internal debate, and that is, let's just assume that the traditions are correct. Let's just assume that the uh, stories surrounding the Prophet, everything we know about the Prophet Muhammad, their, of course, their Prophet Muhammad, uh, since it's they believe it, since they look to him as their paradigm. Let's look then, and let's assume that that's their authority. Let's now unpack it a bit. And of course, the first question comes up, and that is, what is the criteria for a prophethood? And this is a question that Muslims don't really ask. They just assume he's a prophet. Why? Because the Quran says. So I remember asking, having this conversation almost the first time I went down to Speaker's Corner, and I went to my, uh, my uh, Muslim there, and I said, uh, can you prove to me that he's a prophet? Well, yes, the Quran says he's a prophet. Okay, well, can you prove that the Quran is authoritative? Oh, yes, Muhammad said it. it's authoritative. Well, then what gives Muhammad the, the authority? The Quran. And it was just like we were going in a circle. Mm. For a lot of Muslims that are even questioned that, it's just assumed that he is the prophet. It's assumed the Quran is authoritative. These assumptions need to be questioned. And so what we're going to do now is look and unpack this and ask, can we even assume he's a prophet? Does he fit the criteria for prophethood? Now, Muslims will say yes. They'll say for a number of reasons that he is a prophet. Uh, first and foremost, they'll say that the supernatural witness proves that he's a, a prophet. And they'll refer to a story that's from the traditions that talk about the fact that when he was a little child, uh, the angels appeared to him uh, and they open up his chest and they take out his heart, wash his heart, and then put it back in his chest and close it up again. Wow. Now, great story. Yes. Problem is, is that story from the time of his life. Does that even appear in the seventh century? And the answer is no, it comes in Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari is, as we saw in the earlier episode, not written down to the ninth century. Much later, yes. Much, much later. So already you can start to see that there is a problem. Uh, you, there is a problem as far as historicity concerning that story. What are the things they go to? They, they talk about the fact that he prophesies. A and they point to Surah 30, Ayah 1 to 4, where it refers to the defeat uh, of, the, by the, of the Byzantines by the Persians, or we know them as Sassanids. That's the Persian power at that time. And Surah 30 refers to this event. Now, of course, is that a prophecy? Is that a real prophecy? It's a 50-50 chance. Boy, I'd, love right. to, I'd love to go to Las Vegas with those kind of chances. <laughs> not that I go to Las Vegas, but if you had a 50-50 chance as to whether or not they're going to be defeated or not, you could even surmise that if you're living at that time, you would pretty well know whether or not the Byzantines were weak or at our strength because the Byzantines and the Persians were back and forth fighting each other for 200 years. Mm. Sometimes the Byzantines were on top, sometimes the Persians were on top. Could that be considered a prophecy? Probably not. Uh, you could pretty much know whether or not the Byzantines were weakening at that time and pretty much say, yes, they're going to be defeated. What's interesting is, according to what Islam, uh, Islamic experts tell us, that this verse, Surah 30, uh, verses 1 to 4, was revealed in around 615. AD. So in other words, it was revealed about five years after the prophet started re receiving his revelations. The event itself happens in 628. And in the Quran, it says very clearly, in a few years. 615 to 628. Is that a few years? No way. No. Okay. Yeah. What also is interesting is that two years later in 630, the Byzantines come back and defeat the Persians. And Heraclius, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, defeats uh, the Persians, and then writes a reference to that defeat, and he quotes uh, Alexander the Great. Okay. And we've, <laughs> that quote and that whole reference is found in the Quran as well. That's in Surah 18, verses 85 to 103. It's the references concerning dual Karnai, a whole other problem, because that's a borrowing from Heraclius, a emperor, talking about himself and about his destruction, uh, he, himself destroying the Persians. Wow. So. Can this be a prophecy when, when two years later, it's going to go the other way? Yeah, no. But that's the only prophecy I can think of that they point to. I now, mean, a prophet, by definition, must have many prophecies, right? Yeah, many prophecies. And yes. we know this, certainly, the, with the prophecies in the Old Testament. Mm. 
surrounding Isaiah, surrounding Moses. Enormous amount of prophecy, especially at the time of Moses. At the time of Isaiah, also we have prophecies that are pointing to Jesus Christ. We have about 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Jesus Christ, which are fulfilled by Jesus in one way or another. Mm. What's the other criteria they point to? Muslims like to point to the fact that he did miracles. And the question concerning miracles comes up in the Quran. It's found in Surah 17, uh, verses 90 to 93, where the Jews ask Muhammad to perform miracles to prove he's a prophet, because every prophet should be able to do miracles. Can we stop there? I mean, my understanding is that the classical account is that Muslims believe that, no, he wasn't a miracle worker. So you're saying that he was? Oh, well, the answer is in the Quran as well. In Surah 2, Ayah 118 to 119, Surah 6, Ayah 37, and also one verse 124, Surah 13, Ayah 7, and Surah 17, Ayah 59, Muhammad answers that by saying over and over again, I'm nothing more than a warner. Mm. In Surah 54, Ayah 1, he also talks about the splitting of the moon. The reference is there in verse 1 of uh, chapter 54 which suggests that he did do a miracle, and that's the miracle that most Muslims, when I question them, uh, that's the miracle they always point to. Well, listen, he split the moon. But if you look at Surah 51, Ayah 4, it doesn't, say, it doesn't refer to Muhammad at all. If you look at the exegetes who actually uh, translate and under help and, and exegete that verse. So the commentators? The commentators like Baidawi, Zamashari, yes. Tabari, Suyuti, all of them. Look and see how they exegete that verse. None of them. None of them refer to that as referring to Muhammad. They all support that as a verse concerning the last times. And it's wow. when the, the moon is split asunder, that is the beginning mm. of the last times. That is the beginning of the end. Which is consistent with the other surahs, which, uh, which Muhammad is saying himself that he's uh, just simply a warner. That's what he says over and over, over and over again. In fact, in one place he re refers to says, why do you ask if I can do miracles? The prophets before did miracles yet you killed them. Mm. I'm nothing more than a warner. Not much of a defense. Mm -hmm. So certainly Muhammad never considered himself to be a miracle maker. In fact, we don't know of any reference to any miracle that he did in the Quran itself. Besides the splitting of the moon, which Muslims have misappropriated. The other thing they go to is the fact that, they, that he is illiterate. And that's true. According to Surah 7, Ayah 157, and Surah 62, Ayah 2. Why is that important? Well, if he is the one that is given this book, mm. and this book is the greatest revelation in the history of mankind, it cannot be equaled. How could the beauty in this, how many Muslims point to the, uh, the verses, the poetry that's there? And there, are, there is lots of poetry in the Quran. Interestingly, that poetry, uh, we now know where it comes from. That's a whole other problem that we can get into and as to where that poetry comes from. But nonetheless, they would say, how could a man who is illiterate write such a beautiful masterpiece? Yes. Produce a surah like it yes. is referred to over and over again in the well, Quran. Well, that's a good question. And, of course, the question is, could a literate man put together such a book? Hmm. Proving that that's his one great miracle. I get that all the time. That's his one great miracle. And I always respond and say, did he write it down? Mm -hmm. Is he responsible for this? In fact, is Muhammad really responsible for this material? So if he's illiterate, he wasn't. No, we know even the Muslims don't claim he wrote it down. He didn't read or write. It wasn't written down while he was living. Yes. The Quran was written about two to four years after he died, between 620, 632 to 634, according, I'm sorry, about two years after he died, during the time of Abu Bakr. By, not by Muhammad, by a man named Zaid ibn Thabit. Mm. Muslim tradition tells that it was Zaid ibn Thabit that wrote it down. Which Who's Zaid ibn Thabit? Yes. He's not a prophet. He's a secretary. But even he goes all over the place and gets it from different places. Gets it from bones, from bark, from leaves, from the memory of others. And then 18 years later, around 650, has to rewrite it again. Recombine it, recollect it, and take it and rewrite it with three other companions. Zubair, Alas, and Harith. The four of them, according to Sahih Buhari, in volume 6, Hadith number 509 and 510 stipulate that it was, had to be rewritten 18 years later, and if there's any disagreement between the four of them, they are to write it in the Qurayshi dialect, which suggests that it's been rewritten and not just copied exactly uh, from the first copy. Mm. And then after they rewrite it, they take all the other manuscripts that exist at that time and burn them, according mm. to Sahih Buhari, chapter 6, uh, or volume 6, Hadith number 510, which suggests that 
There were this many other manuscripts. And there's no miracle in that. There's not much of a miracle in that. <laughs> and the fact that they burned them suggests that there were many other renditions, yes. uh, many other copies of that, that disagreed. Uh, otherwise, why would you want to burn them? Why would you have to burn them? Yes. So even that's not, uh, uh, that's not a corroboration of his prophethood. Mm. But see, whether or not that's true or not, we're, as Christians, we have a whole other oeuvre to go through. And we need to go and ask, what is it as Christians? How do we consider uh, consider a prophet. Well, who do we consider a prophet? What is the criteria we use? And that's what I'd like to move into now. Okay, yes. Let's go right into that, Ramon. Yes. Let's go look and see what, as Christians, what is it we go to? Where is it we go to? Who is it we go to to consider a prophet? And the Bible is very clear that there are only certain people that can be part of the prophetic line. Not people that can necessarily make a, one prophecy here or another prophecy there. We even know of a donkey that had a prophecy mm -hmm. in the Bible. That's not what we're asking. Who qualifies in the prophetic line? as Muhammad consider, is considered to be in that prophetic line. Mm -hmm. And the first criteria is that he must be, that person must be in the prophetic race. Now, what do we mean by the prophetic race? Well, to understand that, you need to go back to, uh, we need to go right back to Genesis chapter 17. I don't know if you've read it. And when you look at Genesis chapter 17, you will see very clearly that that question was on Abraham's mind. Mm -hmm. If you open up your Bible, and I hope people who are watching open up their Bible as well, just open up and you will see that Abraham looks to God and verse 18 says to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. If only Ishmael, not Isaac, Ishmael be under your blessing. Verse 19, God replies and says, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, God responds concerning Ishmael, he says, as for Ishmael in verse 20, I have heard you, I will surely bless him, I will make him fruitful, and he will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. So God blesses Abraham through Ishmael. Mm -hmm. He says he's going to have 12 sons. They're going to be uh, the leaders of 12 nations. But look what he says next in verse 21. Hugely important. Verse 21, he then says, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will build to, uh, bear to you by this time next year. Verse 21 is so important. My covenant is with Isaac, not with Ishmael. Yeah, see, Muslims say the opposite, don't they? Well, many Muslims are now questioning that. Mm. And that's an ongoing controversy because uh, uh, even the verse in the Quran that talks about uh, the son of Abraham, it doesn't give the name to what son that is. It just says, Abraham's son was asked to go and be sacrificed. Let's go to that chapter because in chapter 22 then, we have the same problem coming up again. Really underlining what God was saying here. In chapter 22 then, Abraham uh, is met by God and God comes to him and says, I want you to give me your son, your only son. If you ch read chapter 22, verse 2, God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Your only son, Isaac. Let's continue on. Later on, he comes again in uh, verse 12. God, because you have not withheld me from me, your son, your only son. God repeats that again in verse 12. In verse 16, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. Three times in chapter 22, God says, your only son, your only son, your only son. Wait a minute. Abraham had two sons. That's right. He had Ishmael and Isaac. Did God forget that? No. Did God make a mistake? Is this an error in the Bible? No, absolutely not. This not. is beautiful. What it's telling us is as mm. far as God is concerned, Abraham only had one son. Mm -hmm. As far as God is concerned, he's already dismissed Ishmael. As far as God was concerned, he's basically said, I don't care about Ishmael anymore. He's not your son because he is what you created. In your, uh, in your eagerness to try to fulfill my, my promise, you have gone ahead and you've get, created another son, basically without my permission. Yes. As far as I'm concerned, God is saying you only have one son. That's very clear in chapter 22. And we don't hear much about Ishmael after that. In fact, nothing really comes from him after that. Hmm. Everything from that time on comes from the line of Isaac. Now, to really underline this, we need to go to Galatians 4. And when you go to Galatians 4, I love this because Paul then picks up this whole thing. And in Galatians, he then takes this and he uses these two women, Sarah and Hagar. Mm. 
starting in verse 21 of Galatians 4. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it was written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. Verse 23, his son by the slave woman, slave woman, isn't that interesting? Slave woman assumes, you know, uh, uh, that uh, as Muslims claim, they are slaves of Allah, are they not? Mm. Abdullah, slave of God. That's right, yes. Now here's a slave woman that, uh, that uh, Paul's pointing to. The slave woman, Hagar, son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way. That's true. But the son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. So these are two covenants that uh, Paul's talking about. One covenant is for Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. Ooh, isn't that even great? Mm. He even points it and puts it in Arabia. So Hagar from Arabia, who is a slave woman, you can't get a better definition of what Islam <laughs> is. Started in Arabia. They are all slaves of God. They look to their lineage through Hagar and Ishmael. Paul continues, corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem, but she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Now coming down to verse 28. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of the promise. At that time the son born by the ordinary way, that's Ishmael, persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit, that's Isaac. Is it the same now? But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. We're to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. We're to get rid of that which man creates. And see, Islam is nothing more than man's creation. The symbolism is beautiful. Now, Paul didn't know about Islam yet. He had no idea what Islam was going uh, to uh, be right. 600 years later. I can't think of a better passage that applies exactly what God was saying there mm -hmm. in Exodus 17. He applies it and says these two covenants. One is man-made, Ishmael, through Hagar, man's choice to try to do what God, they thought God hadn't done yet, produce a son for Abraham. And the other is God made. God promised that he was going to give a son to Sarah who was barren. And now getting back to your question, I mean, you were saying that the prophet had to come from a particular lineage. So how does that connect? Well, if you look at all the prophets, do any of them come in the line of Ishmael? Not that I know Can of, you find no. any prophet here that comes in the line of Ishmael? Not that I know Absolutely of, no. not. Hmm. The only prophet that comes from the line of Ishmael is in this book. 25 prophets that are referred to in the Quran. Four of them, we don't know whose names are. They're names of probably, they're, they're names that don't make any sense. If we did a little more investigation, we probably would find out their sources. That needs yet to be done. Two of them, Ishmael and Muhammad, are in the line of Hagar. The other 19 all come in the line of Isaac. Isn't that interesting? Wow, yes. So even the Quran suggests that the line, the majority of prophets in the Quran all come in the line of Isaac. Yes. Let me just read Surah 20, 27. Because here you find a reference to that, and here is actually the application that's pretty good. I mean, what we're really saying here, this is a test to work out whether someone is a prophet or can be a prophet. Would that be right? Well, yes, and of course, Abraham asking that question mm -hmm. in Exodus, uh, sorry, uh, Genesis, 19, uh, Genesis 17, it's a very good question. What about my son Ishmael? God says, no, I will bless him, mm -hmm. but my covenant is with Isaac. Now, the Quran yes. seems, to, seems to support that in Surah 29, Ayah 27. In Surah 29, Ayah 27, it says this, And we bestowed on him, Ibrahim, Isaac, and Yaqub, and we ordained among his offspring prophethood and the book. Ooh, I love that. Wow. And he, it specifically says, i.e., such as the, uh, the Torah, the, the angel. Yes. So Isaac and then his son. Yeah. Now, it Ishmael's continues on and says also the Quran, but the problem is the Quran doesn't come from I Abraham, yes. Isaac, and Jacob. And Ishmael's not mentioned. Ishmael's not even mentioned there. That's not to say that Ishmael's not mentioned in the Quran. Obviously, yes, yes. the Quran does support the fact that Ishmael is there. But this idea of prophethood coming in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that is specific to the Bible, and that's why we need to go back to the Bible and ask, can we therefore accept Ishmael? No, we cannot. Mm -hmm. We cannot accept Ishmael. He's in the wrong prophetic line. So that's the first problem right there. Yes. Strike one against Muhammad. He's in the wrong line. He's not in the line of the covenant. 
God has already eradicated that Ishmaelic line, and he's basically said that, that he will bless him, but that's all he will do. He will bless his descendants. He will not be in the, in the covenantal line. Is there another problem, a second problem? Yeah, the second problem has to do with the message itself. I don't recall anywhere that you find prophets who contradict each other. If you look at the prophecies, and the reason why is God doesn't contradict himself. He wouldn't that's say right. one thing to one messenger and then say completely something else to another messenger. It's, it would be the same. The same message. There may be embellishments on it. There may be even applications that are different, but the message is the same. Mm. And that's why it's so important that we go look at that message and unpack it. And you will see over and over again, the message continues right through. Now, when you look at all the messages of the prophet, not only do they, do they uh, is more material added to it, but they're all pointing to one thing in one place and one person. They're all pointing to Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus Christ then comes along and fulfills all the other prophetic messages. All that the prophets were waiting for, that they're pointing to, is all filled in Jesus Christ. That's why there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to that man, where he was going to be born, Micah 5, 2, how he was going to be, how he was going to die, uh, between whom he was going to die, the fact that no bones are going to be broken, that's in Psalm 22, mm -hmm. the fact that he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb, uh, the, the, the fact that he, even the mission that he was going to do, mm -hmm. the fact that he was going to come to suffer for us in Isaiah 53, Enormous significance in that. What's interesting is when you go look at all those prophecies of this one man, all fulfilled in Jesus Christ, they all fit to a piece. The Bible all fits to a piece. There's no contradiction at That's all. That's right. Until you come to this book. Mm. Then there's jarring contradictions. Contradiction after contradiction after contradiction. Just take a look and see. Even the contradictions concerning the prophets themselves. Look at the stories of the prophet in here. So what are you suggesting? You're saying that there's no contradictions in the Bible, but there are contradictions in the Quran? Enormous. Even the stories don't make sense. We've talked about this before in the last series where we look at the stories of Abraham in Surah 21, Ayah 51 to Ayah 71. Here's a story of Abraham living in Mecca. That's a contradiction. Nowhere does this talk about Mecca. Doesn't even place him down in Arabia. Mm. Abraham never goes down that far south. He goes to Haran and he starts in Ur, which is in present day Iraq. He goes to Haran and he goes to what is present day Palestine. No reference anywhere about Abraham in Mecca. Gets up in the middle of the night, takes a big idol and destroys all the smaller idols in the Kaaba. <laughs> Next morning the people wake up, they see all the broken idols. They come to Abraham and they blame him for it. He says, don't talk to me, talk to the big idol. Well, they can't talk to the big idol. So they throw him into a fiery pit. Yes. From which God then saves him. Is that in our Bible? No. No, absolutely not. It sounds like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that story. Mm. So the stories even in the Quran don't fit the stories here. But the biggest problem between these two books concerns Jesus Christ. We're going to talk more about Jesus Christ. We're not going to spend too much time about that. This book contradicts Jesus Christ. This book doesn't even get the right name. It spends all its time as a child doing things that I don't even see in this book. And as an adult, the Jesus or the Issa that I see here, because I even have a hard time calling him Jesus, the Issa that I see here denies his divinity and mm. refuses to put him on the cross. And if you don't put Jesus on the cross, we're all damned. Yes. We're all damned. Yes. So I cannot accept these stories. I cannot accept the prophets that are here. And more than that, I cannot accept that these can come from the same God because the revelations contradict each other. And that's the criteria that all prophets must live under. They must all amalgamate to the same the same message. And this is really important because if you have no criteria, if you have no test, no acid test, uh, if I could put it so loosely, then anyone can be a prophet. Listen, my name... Uh, anybody could. Joseph Smith could be a prophet. Yes. Charles Taze Russell could be a prophet. That's right. Sung Young Moon from Korea, he mm -hmm. claims to be a prophet. Mm. There's no test that they could, they would fulfill unless we look and see what the Bible says. Gulag Ahmad that created the Ahmadiyya movement that's causing a lot of problems for Muslims. Mm. He claims to be a prophet. The Bible is very clear. Yes. We've only gone through two of the criteria. We don't have time right now in this segment to go through the next two. We'll unpack that yes. when we come to it. But even with just these first two criteria, does Muhammad follow in the prophetic line? No. Strike one. He's mm. not in the prophetic line. He's not in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Does his revelation parallel with this revelation? Absolutely not, especially mm. when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ. I don't even recognize Jesus in this book. And I don't like the Jesus that I see here. Some things are similar to the Jesus I see here. But this Jesus completely eradicates his divinity and lets another die in his place on the cross. Horrendous when you stop yes. and see the implications of that. So 
For, fortunately, we have this criteria in which we must measure by, and we must measure every profit. The next segment, we're going to uh, episode, we're going to actually look and ask some more serious questions concerning not only the fact that he doesn't have the same revelations. Does he do anything to prove he's a prophet? And what God does he represent? Wow. Let's leave that to the next segment. Good on you. Thank you, Jay. This, it's great to be here. This is, this is really interesting. I mean, I want to know more. I want to learn more. Mm. For our listeners and for our viewers, please stay in tune for the very next episode of Midnight Cry.